Uh, thanks, Magnus. Um, thanks to all the members of the committee. <clears throat> and thanks for that great introduction. Um, so I've, I've been interested in gravitational waves for a long time. Oh, no. <laughs> So um, I, I began this inquiry uh, really with a, a series of uh, stories, uh, stories and thought experiments. And I thought what I would do in the lecture today is give you a sense of the path of behavioral economics, how it started from these stories and thought experiments. And um, we will end up with the... Uh, Swedish social security system, um, which is another uh, experiment. Uh, so uh, maybe my most famous story uh, involves uh, a dinner party and a bowl of cashew nuts. Uh, this was back when I was in graduate school. Uh, a bunch of economists were coming over for dinner. Uh, we put out a, a bowl of cashews and served drinks, and after a while, about half the bowl had been consumed. We were worried about our appetites, and so I took the bowl and hid it in the kitchen. And uh, I then came back, and um, first of all, everybody thanked me. Thank God you got rid of those nuts. Uh, and then, since it was a group of economics graduate students, um, we began to analyze it. Uh, which shows you the danger of going to a dinner party with a group of economists. And uh, so the, the analysis was, A, that we were happy, and B, that we were not allowed to be happy uh, because uh, it's a basic axiom of economics that more choices are always preferred to fewer. And before we had the choice to eat the nuts or not, and now we didn't, so what were we doing uh, being happy. Um, so how is it that having a choice removed can make us better off? Um, this led to uh, a series of papers with my friend Herr Scheffrin on self-control. Um, my second story uh, involves the then chairman of the economics department at the University of Rochester where I was studying who um, I followed in his footsteps in becoming a wine lover. And um, so uh, when I met him, he had been collecting and drinking wine for a long time and had made some wise purchases early on, um, po possibly including even this bottle. Um, but for this story, we're going to say he bought a bottle for $4.95, uh, and later was able to sell it uh, for $100. And um, he had a rule that he wasn't willing to pay more than $30 for a bottle of wine, um, but he sometimes would drink one of his old bottles. Uh, well, that's a puzzle if you're an economist. Um, he won't buy, he won't sell, but he will drink. So um, uh, that's kind of the economist's reaction to this. Um, and that story eventually led to another research stream on what we'll call the endowment effect, loss aversion, status quo bias, and so forth. Um, here's a third story. Uh, these are all from the same vintage, kind of when I was in grad school. Um, a friend and I were given tickets to a basketball game uh, in Buffalo. We were living in Rochester. Uh, there was a big snowstorm, and we wisely decided not to go to the game. But my friend said, had we bought those tickets, we would, have been, we would go to that game. Uh, now, of course, economists call this the sunk cost fallacy. And the, the question is, why would anybody think going to the game helps? So, yes, in that hypothetical where we had paid a lot of money for these tickets, 
Um, there would be that wasted money, but going to the game wasn't going to get that money back. So why is it that there was this temptation to feel like we should go to the game uh, if we had paid for the tickets? And um, th this and many other stories led to a research program on mental accounting. So um, I then met um, these two guys, these two young handsome guys here, uh, Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman. And um, I got an idea from them, uh, the, uh, kind of that made my research possible. Uh, they were busy studying uh, how people make judgments. This is before they wrote their famous paper on prospect theory. And uh, the idea uh, related to earlier work by Herb Simon, um, it says, okay, people are, are boundedly rational, um, and so they use simple rules of thumb to help them make decisions. Um, and then here was the aha moment I got from reading their research, which is that the use of these heuristics not only leads to errors, economists would have no problem with that. We know how to add an error term. Um, the idea was that they would lead to systematic bias. So uh, an, an example is you can ask people what do they think is the ratio of gun deaths by homicide to gun deaths by suicide in the United States. People think homicides are a much more frequent cause of death. In fact, suicides are about twice as often. Uh, that's an example of what they call the availability bias. And it's a, you, can, you can win bar bets based on their research. Um, so uh, one lesson from these stories is that there's a bunch of things that economic theory tells us we can leave out, and in fact makes the strong prediction that they simply will not matter. I call these supposedly irrelevant factors. And really my research can be summarized as there are a lot of these supposedly irrelevant factors that are not irrelevant. They matter. So I call these SIFs, supposedly irrelevant factors. So. Uh, my three little stories illustrate them. If you push the cashews just even to the other side of the table, as we've all done on occasion, you know, maybe with the uh, platter of the delicious bread they insist on giving you in Swedish restaurants, um, we, pushing it to the other side of the table can help. Why in the world should that help? You can reach over there and get it. Uh, the location of the bread is a SIF. Um, the fact that Professor Rosette uh, owned that bottle of wine is a SIF. His willingness to drink it should not depend on whether he owns it, assuming he can buy and sell at the same price. And uh, the sunk cost is another SIF. How much we paid for the tickets shouldn't affect our decision to go to the game. So, um, once we realize that there's this long list of SIFs, uh, we can expand the uh, predictive power of economic theory um, because a lot more stuff matters. So how do we get from stories to science? I'm going to illustrate that with one experiment that I did with my friends Daniel Kahneman and Jack Knetsch. Um, and you'll see the, the mug here um, is, plays a crucial role in this. My last remaining mug is now in the Nobel Museum. <laughs> so uh, I stole these Legos from my grandchildren. Um, and uh, you'll see they're going to play a crucial role in, in this little illustration. So here's how the experiment works. Uh, we start using a technique that was invented by uh, Vernon Smith, 
who uh, shared the Nobel Prize with Danny Kahneman uh, 15 years ago. Um, and w w in using Vernon Smith's technique, we assign values to people. So we do that by saying, if you end up with one of these tokens at the end of the experiment, you can redeem it for the value indicated here. Then we assign tokens at random, which we've done here. And um, incidentally, uh, my friend Linnea, who produced all these beautiful slides, has assigned these at random in the way that Kahneman and Tversky would say is the most random looking way of us randomly uh, assigning, to nicely done, Linnea. Uh, so we've assigned these at random and now we conduct a market in which we allow people to trade. So people who don't have tokens can buy them, people who have tokens can sell them, and then we see what happens. And um, this is what happens, uh, which is exactly what is supposed to happen. And uh, this is an example of what's called the Coase Theorem, uh, named after Ronald Coase, uh, 1991 Nobel laureate. His basic idea is that in a market where transaction costs are low, as they are in this experiment, then the initial assignment of property rights, which in this case was done at random, will not affect the eventual allocation of resources. And we see that's true here. The people, the guys, the Legos on the top row who really love tokens end up with all the tokens. Okay? Now, um, we have the Legos back, and here, the values, we've now arranged the Legos in the order in which they like a Cornell coffee mug. So that guy in the left really wants one of those mugs. Uh, it's worth $20 to him, whereas whoever that guy is in the bottom right... Um, uh, would, has no interest in a Cornell mug. Um, maybe he doesn't like Cornell or he doesn't love coffee or what have you. So uh, now we're going to do the same random assignment. Coincidentally, just the same way. <laughs> uh, in the very random looking assignment. And now we're going to do a, a, another market just the way we did with the tokens. And if the Coase theorem worked, again, the people who love the mugs most would end up with uh, all the mugs. Uh, what actually happened? Um, well, we got about a third as much trading as we should have. And the reason for that was that the people who had mugs didn't want to give them up but the people who didn't have mugs were not that interested in buying one. Um, so what did we learn from this? Two things. One is we can't learn much about human behavior by running experiments in which we assign values to people because that's not the way life works. When we go into the market, there's nobody telling us what we should pay for that loaf of bread or um, that uh, bundle of Swedish meatballs. Um, and when we deal with the real world, then we observe too little trading. Um, why? Well, it's kind of overdetermined. Um, part of it is loss aversion, the idea that uh, it hurts more to give something up than to acquire it. And uh, there's also something called status quo bias, uh, which we will see again later, uh, where people tend to stick with whatever they have. And there are other factors that are reinforcing these. Uh, we know what we have and we kind of like it. 
and um, something else, um, we're not sure what, what we would get. Uh, and then there's just our basic laziness uh, that the sort of thing that when we're watching television, we can find ourselves watching the show that comes on on the same station we've been watching, even though the cost of switching is exactly one thumb click. So, um, as Magnus mentioned, one of the questions we ask in behavioral economics is, what happens if we relax assumptions of unlimited rationality and unlimited willpower? So, uh, we deal with humans, and suppose that these humans are not all as smart as Einstein uh, and uh, don't have perfect self-control. They're more like Homer Simpson. Um, uh, then what? Well, let's take another Nobel Prize winning theory, uh, this one from Franco Modigliani, uh, that's called the life cycle hypothesis. This is the standard economic model of saving for retirement. So uh, let me just illustrate how that's supposed to work. Uh, it, it, it's basically two steps. First, figure out how much you expect to make over your lifetime, how long you're going to live. Then decide how you'd like to smooth consumption over that lifetime, and then do it. So uh, here's an illustration. Here's a very simple case. Um, suppose your income is going to steadily increase until you reach 65, at which point you retire and stop earning money. And suppose you wanted to have a perfectly flat uh, consumption profile. Then you would borrow early in your life you would save later in your life, and then you would dissave. And uh, you would, when you were 20, you would formulate that plan, and then you would do it. Now, of course, life is more complicated than that. Uh, for example, income might have unexpected changes. So, oops, you get laid off, uh, and you go to Silicon Valley and make a bundle of money. Oops. Uh, there's a the startup doesn't do so well, but then you write a <laughs> then you write a book. Um, so uh, you know that that that's uh, those are income uh, surprises. We can have consumption surprises. Uh, that sports car was irresistible. Kids move back in. Kids don't even think about it. Uh, maybe the grandchildren, they're cute. But uh, then, you know, you get old and all kinds of stuff happens that you don't anticipate. So you can see um, this is hard. Um, and so people might need some help. And the econs in economic theory don't need any help. They can just figure all this out. They can figure out what they need to do, and they don't have any self-control problems, so they just do it. Um, now, this is a new problem that humans face. We've been around for millions of years, they tell us. Um, and um, for most of our time on Earth, saving for retirement was not something anyone needed to worry about. Uh, the reason is you would die first. So um, those that did manage to live long enough to be able to stop working, uh, the solution was move in with their kids who conveniently uh, were living next door and um, still were willing to have their parents move in. Um, and then in the 20th century, uh, these norms started to break down. The kids moved away. Parents started living longer. And so we had to solve this problem. And some of the s solutions, the early solutions, were things like um, 
social security systems and companies sponsoring defined benefit uh, pension plans. And uh, those are the old plans where what you, you got an annuity based on how long you worked and what you made. And uh, these plans were very easy for us humans because there were no choices. You just, you got taxed on your income and then you got your social security payments. Uh, the same with your job, you worked. There, there, you, there were, the, the, re the retirement was all in the background. And then when you retired, um, you got this annuity and um, life was easy. Uh, well, firms and countries discovered that, um, especially pay-as-you-go uh, pension plans can lead to problems, and so they created uh, new strategies called defined contribution plans, and in, these are much harder for humans. Uh, humans have to decide whether to join the plan, and then if they join, how much to save, and then if... They, uh, and then how to invest that money. Um, and uh, some people don't bother to join. Um, those who join may not save enough or may not invest particularly wisely. And uh, notice that the traditional model is of no help whatsoever in solving this problem because it assumes people have solved it. And if they're not saving enough, well, that's because they don't expect to live very long or are happy um, not having very much when they retire. So if they're just saving the right amount, you have no advice to give them and, and there's no reason to offer them help. So how can behavioral economics help? Well, um, one way is using uh, what uh, Cass Sunstein and I refer to as choice architecture. So choice architecture is the environment in which we make decisions. So uh, one example is a menu. If you go to a restaurant, the chef has decided uh, what he or she wants to cook, but there's somebody at the restaurant whose job is to write that down into a menu. And it could be a simple menu. Uh, you can have a four course or a six course dinner and you have no choices. Or it could be, you know, one of these menus at a Chinese restaurant that seems to be endless. Um, and uh, so one lesson from behavioral economics is that what you order will depend on the structure of the menu. And uh, in an Italian restaurant, if the pasta courses are in a separate category, uh, people will order differently than if they are mixed in uh, with the other appetizers um, or entrees. Uh, store layouts, again, if you assume people just go to the store and buy the optimal bundle, then the way the store is arranged won't matter. It'll be another SIF. Um, but stores have learned that's not right, and they spend a lot of money figuring out how they want you to walk through a supermarket and make sure you pass by the things that are most profitable. And they stick things like milk in the back of the store because that's the thing you buy most often, and um, you're be sure to walk by a lot of tempting other things when you go by. Um, uh, places like Amazon, of course, uh, have spent billions thinking about choice architecture. So uh, one of the lessons of uh, choice architecture and the title of the book Cass and I wrote is that cho the choice architecture um, can influence what we pick because it will include uh, what we call nudges. So what are nudges? Nudges are features of the environment that influence the behavior of humans but would not influence the behavior of econ. So 
where an item is on the menu doesn't affect Homo economicus, but it does affect us. So um, the, the feature of uh, nudges that we stress in our book is that nudges are a way to influence choices without forcing anyone to do anything. And uh, we called the philosophy we uh, espoused libertarian paternalism. Um, many people did think this phrase was an oxymoron. Um, uh, we wrote a paper called libertarian paternalism is not an oxymoron. Um, a, a law professor wrote another paper saying libertarian paternalism is an oxymoron. I was lobbying with Cass that we should write a rejoinder that says, no, it's not. <laughs> Reason prevailed. Um, so uh, what are some nudges? Uh, uh, maybe the most powerful nudge we have in our arsenal is simply to change the default. So what, what is the default? The default is simply what happens if you do nothing. Now, we're really good at doing nothing. Passivity is one of humans' greatest skills. So uh, an application uh, of this idea in the domain of pension plans is uh, what's come to be known as automatic enrollment. So in the old system, when you were first eligible for the pension plan, you, there were a bunch of forms you had to fill out and um, you'd have to decide how much to save and then how to invest. There could be a big long pile of these forms. Some people, like my friend Cass, are very norm averse or form averse. Um, and if Cass has to fill out a form, he's almost certain not to do it. So uh, what does automatic enrollment do? It says you get the same pile of forms, but on the top page, it says, if you don't fill these forms out, we will enroll you in the pension plan at this saving rate and in this fund, and you don't have to do anything. So um, that's a SIF, right? The default is a SIF. It takes a minute or two to fill out these forms. Um, so it shouldn't matter. Does it matter? Yes, big time. So this is some data from Vanguard um, that administers uh, thousands of these plans. The purple lines are the percentage of people that are enrolled for plans that use automatic enrollment. The gray lines are for those that don't. And you can see for any income group, about 90% of the people join if we use automatic enrollment, uh, much less for other groups particularly for lower income groups. So this, this, is a, uh, uh, this is a nudge that's particularly effective at helping lower income people save for retirement. Well, uh, there's a problem with automatic enrollment, and that is that, uh, uh, particularly in the United States, the firms that uh, employ this strategy almost universally enroll people at too low of a level, uh, often 3% of income. Uh, that is not enough uh, to save for retirement. So um, how can we solve this problem? My former student Shlomo Benartzi and I uh, took this on. And uh, what we decided to do is think about this starting with the psychology and, and ask, um, well, what is it that's preventing people from saving enough? Uh, well, one is self-control problems. Um, we can go out for a fancy dinner tonight. That's tempting. Um, whereas saving for retirement, that's sometime off in the future. Um, and we know people have more self-control for the future uh, than for now. Many of us are planning diets, uh, not this week, 
certainly, uh, maybe after the new year. Um, the second is uh, loss aversion that I've previously mentioned. People don't like to see their income go down. Um, so we wanted to take that into consideration. And then inertia. Uh, people are good at doing nothing. So our idea was we know these three things are preventing people from saving. Let's flip the problem around and use those to create a plan that will... Um, take those weaknesses, if you want to call it that, and uh, use them to help. Um, so uh, the plan we created, we called Save More Tomorrow. And uh, the basic idea was to invite people now to save more later, uh, because self-control is easier for later. It's like the, our diet plan that will start in January. Um, and particularly to invite them to save more when they get their next raise so they won't see their income go down. That will eliminate the loss aversion. And then we're going to keep that up uh, until they hit some goal. Uh, so we'll get inertia working for us. So the, we spent years trying to get any company to try this and we finally found one in Chicago. And in this particular implementation, the company, it was a small company, they hired a financial advisor and offered his services to any employee. It was about 300 employees. And um, for most of them, he, the advisor said, uh, we think you should save at least five percentage points more. And most of the employees said that you're nuts. I can't afford that. So then and only then were they offered the Save More Tomorrow plan. And uh, it was an, a, quite an aggressive one. Um, their saving was increased by three percentage points every time they got a raise. So uh, notice this is all a SIF, right? With life cycle savers, A, they would have no interest in joining Save More Tomorrow because they're already saving the right amount. And if it was put in, they would undo it because they are already saving the right amount. So, uh, so it shouldn't work. A, no one should join. And B, their behavior won't change. Well, let's see what happened. Um, the first line of this chart are the people who said they didn't want to talk to this financial advisor. And you can see the, the inertia in this system. These numbers fluctuate a little. It's not that anyone is doing anything. It's in, uh, there's attrition. So we, some people uh, leave the company. Um, then here is the group that took the advice to go up by five percentage points. Uh, you can see they did that and then stopped. Uh, then here are our guys. And you can see we almost quadrupled saving rates using supposedly irrelevant factors. Now, uh, a question we asked and, and we were asked at hundreds of workshops. Yes, but maybe you get them to save more over here, but then they're undoing it somewhere else that you can't see. And for 30 years or so, I was trying to figure out how to test and possibly reject this alternative hypothesis. Um, I never could find the data that would allow me to do that. Uh, fortunately, in Scandinavia, there are no secrets. And uh, so um, the great young economist, Raj Chetty, and some colleagues were able to test this hypothesis in nearby Denmark. Um, and here's essentially what they did. They looked at people who switched jobs 
where their pension contributions went up by at least three percentage points. And you can see what happens to their pension saving. It goes up and they, right? So this is people being passive uh, the way we've seen in the other things I've shown you so far. But what are they doing in their other behavior? Here's their company pensions, nothing. Here's their other saving, nothing. So, um, no, we're not stealing from some other pot. Um, uh, it's all net saving. Okay, let me end um, with some uh, new research I've been doing with uh, two of my former students, uh, Henrik Kronkvist, who's Swedish, um, and Frank Yu, who, uh, who's not. Um, this is a multinational team. Um, and uh, it involves, as the locals uh, may know, um, in 2000, uh, Sweden introduced something they called the premium pension system. And it has the following key features. Um, there's a 16% payroll tax that goes to fund Social Security. 2.5% uh, is directed toward this new premium pension system. Um, there were 450 options in this plan. Essentially, any mutual fund approved by the EU that wanted to get in was allowed in. Now, um, when it was launched, the system had two nudges. Now, they weren't called nudges um, because we hadn't coined that term yet, but they were nudges nonetheless. Um, so nudge number one was there was a default. If you didn't fill out a form, then um, you would be given this default fund with the spiffy title AP7. Um, and, and so anybody who didn't want to make a choice was in that fund, and then some people who found it attractive. It was actually a pretty well-designed fund uh, with low fees. Um, they would also get that, uh, that choice. Um, that fund has done pretty well, so all the economists I know here claim they actively picked it. Um, I want to tell those people we now have your data, <laughs> so we're going to be checking. Uh, so we're going to call these delegators. They delegate their investment decisions uh, to the people at AP7. Uh, nudge number two, and this one is a bit curious. Um, the government decided that in spite of creating this 13 basis point globally diversified fund, um, really people should choose their own portfolios from this array of 450 funds. Um, and they launched a big advertising campaign saying choose for yourself. It's your duty as a Swedish citizen to create the best possible portfolio. Um, so the government advertised, that was the largest advertising campaign in Swedish history. Uh, it, it was supplemented um, by funds advertising as well, um, saying um, yes, choose for yourself, and in particular, choose our fund. Um, th these ads were not particularly informative. Uh, here's, uh, here's one. Um, so Indiana Jones thinks you should invest in whatever this fund is. Uh, it's a kind of a scary picture. I'm not... Uh, my wife used to teach advertising. I don't know whether she would approve of this ad. But uh, anyway, uh, there were those ads. 
And so what happened? We have a battle of the nudges, the default versus the urging. Uh, which one? Uh, our theory doesn't tell us anything about that. Um, but the, the, the ad campaign won. So two-thirds of Swedish citizens decided to form their own portfolios. Uh, the rest took the default. Now, um, since then, new people entered the system, mostly young people entering the workforce for the full time, first time, or immigrants. Um, the advertising campaigns stopped. Both the government and the funds stopped advertising, and um, there were some lingering effects of those. Some people are joining just a month after the campaign ended, but then it wore out. And here's what happened. So um, you can see this is year one when two-thirds of the people uh, chose their own portfolios. That tapered off. And in recent years, almost no one is choosing their own portfolio. Those numbers on, on the right are about half a percent. So um, that's kind of interesting, right? Um, it, so, um, but w w one of the questions we're interested in is, well, how long do nudges last, right? So th those guys on the left, were fr well, actually, uh, until 2008, they were locked in. There was an obscure rule, the justification of which um, no one has been able to explain to me. But if you, uh, maybe somebody here knows, um, but if you turn down the default fund, you weren't allowed to take it later uh, until 2008. Uh, then they changed that rule. But um, so one of the questions is, those guys who were nudged to be individualistic, did they stay that way? And if so, that would be interesting because almost no one has chosen to do that since. Um, so 27% of the people in the default fund have left and decided to become do-it-yourselfers. But essentially no one that started as a do-it-yourselfer has switched. There, so this nudge has lasted more or less forever. Um, and that's in spite of the fact that the default fund has had drastic changes. So in 2010, the managers of the fund decided they wanted to juice the returns. Well, hopefully. So uh, they decided to add leverage. Now, what does that mean? Technically, they were borrowing and buying options, but uh, the details of that are not important. You, uh, they initially had 125% leverage, meaning that um, if the market went up 10%, the fund would go up 12. Then they switched to 50% leverage. So 50% um, leverage means that if the market goes up 10%, you go up 15%. But if the market falls 10%, uh, the fund falls 15%. Now, uh, in hindsight, these guys look like geniuses uh, since the market has pretty much steadily gone up since they took these. But we can ask, what would happen if we had another financial crisis? So what would this fund have done in the period 2006 to 2008? The answer is down 82%. So... You know, this is a pretty big change. 
And uh, so a question that Frank and Henrik and I have been exploring is, um, did anybody notice this? So, um, by the way, there are now 900 funds because 450 really wouldn't do. So, um, uh, and one of those 900 funds is identical to the default fund but has no leverage. So it was possible, if you liked the thing you were in, and these guys in the room, and I know who you are, who claim they picked the default fund by choice in their wisdom, I'm looking at you, Pear, um, presumably they were picking an unlevered fund and, you know, might have noticed that gee, this thing has gotten a lot of risk. Uh, maybe I should switch into this other fund that's just like the one I allegedly actively picked. Um, so did anyone notice? So here's a plot of the leverage over time. Um, this is the number of people that were leaving the default fund. I don't know whether you can read those numbers. The, uh, the scale goes from zero to 400, uh, maybe up to 600. There are 3 million investors in this fund. So uh, our conclusion is we cannot reject the hypothesis that 3 million Swedish investors are asleep. They may be asleep. We cannot rule that out. Um, they certainly are not deserting the fund in droves. Uh, so what can we conclude from this? Um, the first is nudges can be quite powerful. Both the nudge of creating a default, which has recently been all powerful, and the earlier nudge saying, please don't take the default. Uh, that was also very powerful. Uh, second, and this we've never been able to test before. Thank you, Sweden, for giving us this opportunity. Uh, we now know nudges can last at least 17 years, um, possibly longer. Um, and it's suggesting a new marketing campaign for our nudging efforts. So, uh, let me conclude. Um, it is possible, um, many people told me early on, it's just not possible to do economics any other way. It wouldn't be economics. So that's not true. It's possible to do economics um, without homo economics. Sorry. Uh, second, if we learn from other social scientists, uh, we can improve economics. We, we can increase its explanatory power. And it can give us all kinds of new tools that we can use to uh, improve people's um, outcomes. Um, so in short, we can nudge for good. Thank you.